Bonjour et bienvenue à tous pour cette nouvelle vidéo de la chaîne Edo Télé. Aujourd'hui, nous recevons Georges Barcas, un encordeur de Vancouver, qui va nous parler de son approche des cordes. Uh, hi, George. Um, Bonjour. Ah, you... <laughs> oh, you're speaking French. You can do a un petit peu. <laughs> je, je, je compris uh, un petit peu. OK. Um... I wouldn't dare to speak. I have too much respect <laughs> for the language. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. For, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, can you introduce yourself for uh, our spectators? Mm, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is George Barkas. Uh, I am a professional rope educator um, living in Vancouver in Canada and uh, originally from uh, Vienna, Austria. I moved here 2015 and um, I try to combine my various backgrounds and interests in uh, my journey through rope bondage and uh, through the journey of education, I would say, and the philosophy of not only rope bondage, but uh, ropes in its contexts. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And um, you have studied um, uh, Shibari with uh, Osada Steve and uh, Yukimura Arumi. Uh, can you tell us a little more about their respective styles uh, and what influences they have they had uh, on your own approach to the ropes? Uh, well, may maybe a, a little bit before a little bit the uh, hi historiography about yeah. about this. Um, uh, Historiality <laughs> with uh, Derrida. Um, when I started doing ropes, I I saw somebody tying with my partner back then, and um, I saw her facial expression while being in ropes, and I said to myself, I want to be able to recreate this facial expression. Okay. And so I I I started to learn ropes, and for the first maybe 10, 11 months, I only tied. Uh, like a, a three rope takate kote and uh, a futomomo and a yokutsuri sideways suspension and um, and it became um, I, I I got frustrated because uh, even uh, even though I tied every day and I tied um, like I became better and better the facial expression didn't even come close to mm -hmm. where where I thought it should be. And I wanted to give up ropes again. Okay. And uh, then a friend of mine uh, from Vienna who, who taught me these uh, few techniques um, sent me basically to Osada Steve in, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, this is basically the last, uh, last straw to, uh, for, for my rope journey because what for? And I went there and uh, Osada Steve tied um, a couple reps around the person. Uh, upper body and um, he had a twist in the ropes mm. and immediately one of the sports riggers uh, said oh but sensei you have a twist in the ropes and he stepped aside and said does she look happy and she was melting yeah. and um, everybody said yes 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 and then he said uh, see I don't give a shit well sorry <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. I don't give a shit whether the whether the ropes are twisted, as long as the person in ropes is happy. Yeah, and um, he added that uh, the ropes can be as twisted as the soul of the person in ropes, and mm -hmm. who is interested in a flat personality? I agree. And I said, okay, I want to study with you. <laughs> so and so not, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we invited him in 2011 to Vienna, and he he used uh, used um, he asked uh, me and my friend to be um, like co-instructors during the workshop, and so uh, like we we said yes because it's uh, like impolite to refuse. Yeah, sure. Line, <laughs> and so um, I became an Osada Ryu instructor. He appointed me, so to say, and. Um, In 2000, when was this? I forget a little bit the times, but it's not so important. Um, when I came, like I wanted to re-invite him to Vienna, but he became very sick. 
Oh, yeah. And um, so I came to Japan and uh, he sent me basically most of the time there. We spent uh, a bit over a month in Japan uh, then. Okay. And uh, he sent me to Yukimura Haruki Sensei. Okay. And um, what I experienced there is, uh, I don't know how, how to put it into words, but um, I realized that um, like fairly early on there that it is not about the ropes. It is also about ropes. But uh, you cannot do ropes without being um, somewhat, and that sounds a little bit uh, like a wooey, but uh, without being a, a complete person. Uh, Yukimura Hoki sensei, uh, like he wasn't only a rope person and a porn actor and producer, he was also a poet and uh, like calligrapher and uh, painter. And uh, was interested in this and in this and in this. And um, all of this influenced his, uh, his rope. And uh, he, uh, like uh, maybe, how, how did it influence me and how is it influenced? Mm, how, how did it influence each other? Uh, in the beginning, when you start with with like uh, one teacher and you see another one, it's quite like an, a next to each other. Yeah. And at some point, you realize that uh, when you are able to create your own language, when you like, you don't have to switch your vocabulary, but uh, you can use your own vocabulary to describe what others do, mm -hmm. and it is not wrong. It is just another type of expression. Okay. So um, Yukimura Haruki Sensei told me, breathe, breathe, Barkas, breathe, when, when I tied. And I said, um, Sensei, I'm, uh, I'm 30, what, 33 years old, 32 years old. I, it, I find it ridiculous to breathe like a dirty old man. <laughs> and he said, I understand that, yes, but breathe. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and he kept saying, but breathe. And um, at some point I wanted to trick him and focused solely on my breathing. Mm -hmm. A conscious, quiet, so that he can't hear it, okay. breathing. And what that to me was, I gained distance from the scene, from myself, and all of a sudden I could see everything that happened. Okay. So I was all of a sudden standing on a, a point of view from which I could care more for the person in ropes because I could see everything. Like if you were outside of the scene or just because you get you got mm -hmm. a higher point of view on, on your own Inside? Yeah. So uh, many, many people in ropes uh, like adhere to this romantic, uh, neo-romantic idea to, to get lost in the scene, to dissolve, to unionize, uh, un unite, sorry, not unionize, <laughs> uh, unite with the person in ropes to become one. Yeah. And uh, think of uh, other kind of situations in a social environment where these things are actually a, a large obstacle to a rope scene. For example, a paramedic. A paramedic who comes to a rope to, to an accident and tries to do everything to save this person that is injured and uh, jumps right in and puts pours their whole heart, pours their whole heart into the scene. It's quite easy to make a mistake that way, but to stay detached, to, um, to do what your hands are knowing, uh, to, to be professional. Mm -hmm. That professionalism requires some kind of detachment. And that is what I've learned um, 
not learned from because he didn't explicate it. But um, what I have discovered while learning uh, from Yukimura Huki Sensei. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Osada Steve uh, always uh, often said his goal in life is to become as kind of a person as Yukimura Huki Sensei. Oh, yeah, really? And um, I, I would say that is also one of my goals. Okay. It's, it's um, a little amazing. Um, so, uh, so, so I'm into Shibari since about two years. Uh, I have discovered very recently the work of uh, Yukimura Aomi. Um, Haruki. Uh, Haruki, sorry. Oh, all good. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I've just heard a few things about him, uh, being a, a porn producer and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, in, uh, in in my culture, a uh, porn producer might not be a kind person, you know? <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, he, he often said... Um, Tying for the camera is um, tying for an audience that just wants to jerk off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tying in person with somebody uh, is something completely else. Okay, it's not about jerking off. It's not about uh, not uh, not necessarily about jerking off. Okay. So his style is uh, very different than the one I've can uh, discovered on Hotflix uh, or in his video. Or... The techniques are similar. The, um, when you tie for the camera, you uh, you need to you have an audience that pays you. Hmm. So um, your prime concern is producing something creating something content that uh, the the um, like the group of people who pays for it uh, mm. gets mm -hmm. what, what what they want um, while of course not uh, neglecting any uh, safety and consent concern with the person in ropes of mm -hmm. course not mm. but uh, tying with somebody it's um, is to discover somebody, is to, to um, I'm quite happy that uh, a, a French person interviews me, to be honest. Really? <laughs> because um, when I say to read somebody in, uh, in North America, it is uh, usually considered that there is uh, one exact right reading of somebody. Okay. Uh, a scientific reading of somebody. Mm. Uh, if I read somebody, then the story that I read is must be true, or else it is wrong. Mm. When I um, when I say reading somebody with uh, to anybody I have met from France, mm. then the the understanding is more in the sense of um, uh, like interpretational reading. Mm -hmm. Much like Roland Barthes, uh, the the critic becomes an author themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the author is dead anyways. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, metaphorically. So um, tying with somebody, not necessarily for the camera, is to to go as as if you would go into a city. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have your 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 famous sites. You have your Eiffel Tower. You have your Louvre. You have your um, Montmartre, whatever. Uh, but you also have the the back alleys, the side streets, the not so um, glamorous, uh, famous uh, uh, things. You this you have uh, the opportunity to to read somebody beyond the, the famous lines of the poem. Yeah. And you have the opportunity to interpret somebody 
through your own eyes, through your own history. Hmm. Okay. It's interesting. Um, those two dimensions of readings, um, um, they don't compete with each other. Uh, they are just different. Okay. Can you tell us a little more about your school in uh, Vancouver? Well, right now we just uh, sent out a newsletter that the venue is closed. <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, that's the actuality. <laughs> so my my school in Vancouver, uh, I um, I opened together with my with my partner Eddie the the space two. Okay. The space two is um, is an is an idea to uh, have a venue that is um, both uh, like a hub or uh, a harbor for a community that tries to um, explore themselves, their mm -hmm. own personalities, the personalities of their partners, uh, respectively, as well as um, a venue that uh, is able to host my, my school of rope bondage. Okay. And my school of rope bondage so is two different two different things that merge into each other that intertwine, and my school is uh, based on well based on my own experiences and um, wh when I when I describe it maybe I would like to uh, found something that is. In the direction of Jacques Lecoq's uh, uh, theater school, okay, that is uh, that follows a, a, a curriculum that is based not only of like maybe only to an eighth or a tenth on rope patterns. Of course, you need the rope patterns, okay. but um, like that has uh, movement, that has psychology, that has philosophy, that has. Um, uh, literature mm -hmm. that has uh, all kinds of uh, ideas combining so that, as I said about uh, what I've learned from Yukimura uh, Hoki-sensei, uh, um, to become a, more of a complete person, to uh, feed the rope bondage scenes, the personal tying, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to feed that uh, from more and different kind of uh, like um, uh, buffets <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, one very very important aspect of this is that um, is this diversity of approaches okay so uh, uh, there is this this quarrel going on in the rope world this argument this bitter war really? about uh, those who say, no, rope is erotic, rope is sex. And then there are those who say, oh, I use ropes for art. Uh, mm -hmm. I use ropes for, um, for athleticism. Like mm -hmm. they want to do self-suspension and go up into the air and try to stretch their shoulders and do uh, like w whatever. Uh, then uh, ropes is there for those who want to use it therapeutically. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe more in the in the interview styles about about this, uh, but um, this people come and want to learn ropes for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. And who am I to tell them which is like uh, uh, which is the proper reason? So what I do with my school is I try to uh, like um, provide an opportunity for people to to say okay, I want to learn ropes for that reason. Mm -hmm. Which path do I have to go? And uh, I created this idea of the city of Kimbaku. Okay. Which is a metaphor for a curriculum. So you arrive at the train station and learn some basics, some mm -hmm. uh, single column ties, some um, uh, okay. commonly agreed, agreeable like uh, facts about consent and safety etc et mm -hmm. and uh, then i have various districts okay. i have um, a red light district mm -hmm. i have um, uh, 
an amusement park, I have an art district, I have a university district, uh, mm -hmm. etc., etc. And then people can say, okay, I want to learn ropes for, let's say, um, the engineering part. What do I have to learn? And then I can say, okay, come to the Tuesday trainings. Because on Tuesday, we learn the engineering, uh, like uh, on Tuesday is more focused on the engineering part. Okay. Um, the, the, the mechanical aspects and the... Armor. The mechanical aspects, like differential geometry for rope bondage, um, uh, like uh, forces, uh, knots, etc., etc., etc. Somebody else comes and says, I want to learn ropes for meditation. Then I say, okay, then come more on the Thursday, but Thursday is also red light district. Mm. But you don't need to make it dirty to uh, or dirty yeah. uh, in in mm -hmm. order to meditate. Yeah. Right? So, like such ideas. Uh, that is my that is my my school, I would say. And I <laughs> went away quit, uh, pretty quickly from this idea, this rather ridiculous idea that this. Uh, based on some uh, romanticized orientalism, uh, mm -hmm. this beginner, uh, what is Shuhari uh, uh, stuff, this uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced, right. that does not work. Mm -hmm. um, you can be, I have students who are extremely advanced in uh, the technical aspects, mm -hmm. but they are not interested in the, in the like, uh, communication aspect so much. Okay. Um, so they are advanced in, uh, in, in like suspensions, mm -hmm. but, uh, if I look at their communication skills, um, maybe like more between beginner and intermediate. Yeah, okay. So I, I, uh, pin those like, um, novice, um, advanced beginner, um, sufficient, uh, or not sufficient, proficient, etc. Okay. Um, more on the districts that I have in my city. Okay. So the, you have drawn a map, or is it just... Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, is it here? Ah, oh, excellent. Uh, Armonia drew this. Yeah, yes. she's an amazing artist. Yes. I can, it is on my website. I can send you a link. Okay. We'll insert it in the video. Um, yes. So you, you help each uh each of your school attendants to to build his own uh way in your city and to to yes. find his own interest uh, is there some very famous monuments in your uh, city like the eiffel tower in paris or it's uh... <laughs> well um one one uh i would say a famous uh monument is the archive that is burning oh yeah <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a joke. It's a reference to a book by uh, Georges Didi Übermann. Okay. Uh, the, the archive is burning. Okay. Because, um, like he says, the, the essence of an archive uh, is its gaps. What is not in the archive uh, is interesting for an archaeology in Foucault's sense um, to explore. Why is it not there? Why? Um, has it been burnt away from the archive? So when I tie and read somebody, as we discussed before, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm also interested in the gaps of the archive, of the personal gaps. So um, I tie with somebody and um, uh, like I tie with 100 people and I do a certain technique and 99 people react quite similarly. Okay. And this one person does not have that reaction. Why? That's, I'm that's interested in, in this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that brings me to the, the next question, quite naturally, because uh, you have written a book called uh, Archaeology of Personalities, a Linguistic Approach to uh, of Erotic Home Bondage. Um, I have many questions regarding this book because uh, uh, I'm... I love it personally. Uh, I'm oh, still in the process you. of reading it. I'm usually a quite a, quite a quick reader, and on this one, I, I'm taking all my time. Um, the the first one, the first question is uh, quite obvious. You during the book, you mostly use the term erotic hold bondage rather than kimbaku or shibari. Uh, why? What is the reason behind this choice? <laughs> Bachelard. 
Bachelard. Um, uh, in uh, the Poetics of Space, suggests that for a philosophy of the world, one should look at its adjectives. Okay. N not that it's nouns, because everything is an adjective. So when we say Kimbaku, what does it mean aside from some, uh, again, some like over romanticized Orientalism? Mm. Well, the word itself, to the best of my knowledge, um, which is not far in this direction, Kimbaku is uh, not older than uh, 90 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody told, some native speaker told me that uh, the, um, the kanjis uh, like have been translated uh, wrongly in the 90s as uh, tight binding. Okay. Uh, where it is much more as uh, like uh, understandable as um, tying with anticipation. The a uh, kin in Kimbaku can be apparently, and I again, I don't want to start the war again on the stupid internet, um, is more like as in uh, like excitement or anticipation. Okay. Why did I not use Kimbaku so often? Uh, because I don't, I don't know it. I... Um, To a certain degree, it has been in. Uh, let me let me rephrase this. Uh, Ranbo, my my uh, the style that I have developed, this uh, one one approach mode of tying. Um, I called it when when I have been asked to give workshops in this style. I called it what Shibari the rough way. Or so. okay. I was young and needed the money, right? Mm -hmm. And. Um, then uh, Osada Steve called me and said, I talked to somebody who uh, is a native speaker and he told me, uh, you should call it Ranbo, okay. which uh, can be interpreted as, um, or translated as uh, like stormy, overwhelming. Okay. Uh, Beijing Be Ranbu, a book by Ito Seo san, uh, the, the, the Wild Dance of a Beautiful Woman, uh, from 1932 or so. So, um, and uh, Steve uh, added very, very like adequately for the rope world, uh, call it Ranbu, because if it has a fancy Japanese name, it will sell better. <laughs> <laughs> and so I called it Ranbo, and it sold better. Ah, you had to. Your teacher told you to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, and with Kinbaku, I feel like it is somehow the same. Mm, why is it used? I have met uh, Japanese people who call, uh, who say bondage, the English word, because it sounds fancy to use a foreign word. Okay. So, but. Um, yeah, bondage has its own like his history, its own acting in this social um, const, uh, like contract that this language, mm. right? Like uh, when you Google, uh, like a, uh, when you make a historiography of uh, bondage, then you will end up very soon in very religious texts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I... I prefer to look at the adjectives and at the ver verbs, not so much at the nouns. Okay. So, so if you call something, sorry? The adjective erotic here is very important for you, or is it? Yeah, and I'm not happy anymore <laughs> with that title. <laughs> <laughs> what name would uh, you use now if you were to write this book now? It's I'm, I'm, I would say uh, like rope bondage. Okay. I would say tying. Yeah. But I'm not sure if I would use it at all. Uh, erot if I think about it, uh, and to quote, uh, like most of the people I quote are French people, so uh, like, uh, uh, c'est parfait. Yeah. Um, uh, Georges uh, the like um, uh, eroticism, eroticism, uh, like uh, death and sensuality. 
what is erotism but uh, a uh, transgression into a taboo so li like death it's nothing but the transgression into a taboo mm -hmm. and when we tie with each other we we enter Oh no, like uh, uh, people other than French people will hate me, but another French, uh, Foucault's uh, heterotopias, okay. heterotopic, um, like when we tie, we enter a totally other space. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that is characterized by an inversion of commonly agreed upon moral standards. When we see somebody on a park bench with a neck rope, we hopefully go there and help. Mm -hmm. If we see somebody in a rope bondage uh, venue with a neck rope, we say, oh, what a good time they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, when we enter a rope bondage scene, we enter a totally other space, a counter space to society. And so um, if we use erotic in a, more, in a sense more like uh, Bataille uses it, Mm -hmm. then I subscribe to the use of erotic. Okay. But um, for most people, it will not have this meaning. In this. Exactly. And that's why I'm hesitant to use it. Okay. So you don't use it anymore? Mm, I use it when it's adequate. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the foreword by Osada Steve, um, mm -hmm. he starts by defining uh, Kinbaku as an art form. Mm. Why is it an art form or, and not just a technical skill? You, you said earlier that in your city you have the engineering part, the engineering district, and some other district. So, well, yes. I also have an art district. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I uh, think that it is an art because of, um, it can be an art rather than a technical skill. Uh, like every art is also a technical skill, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. But um, I would describe it as an art if two conditions are fulfilled. One condition is that it is a conscious deviation from technical perfection. Okay. Just because a tie is tied Mm, improperly doesn't make it beautiful or doesn't make it art. It needs to be deviated from technical perfection consciously. I need to make, I as the one who ties, need to make the dis decision consciously that I don't give a shit about the twist in the rope. Yeah. And the other thing is, And uh, that is uh, basically where some of my philosophy hangs on. Uh, whenever a word has two different meanings in more than one language, then I get interested. <laughs> And uh, yeah. in two languages with two different meanings in each language. Yes. And um, one such word is the word... Um, two words actually with the same double meaning in more than one language is uh, to move somebody or to be moved right mm -hmm. and the other is to touch somebody or to be touched okay. so um, I would say rope bondage is also an art like it's an art when the first condition is fulfilled and if it is moving if it moves people. And moving can there be understood as to be moved um, somewhere in the history of that person. It can, art can move somebody back into a memory from uh, whenever. So it's an art if uh, the artist... If, if it's an, it, it is an move. art if it, if it is moving or touching. Yeah. And if it is a conscious deviation from, uh, from technical perfection. Okay. A technically perfect tie is boring. Yeah. The, 
neither the person in ropes has something from it just because the ropes is uh, perfectly attached, nor does an observer have like get anything from it. There needs to be something that uh, makes you questioning, that makes you ask why. For the person being tied, mm. yeah, and uh, for uh, some spectators, no, it's not the case, I guess. Well, there is always an ex uh, a spectator. Okay. Uh, even if you are only the two of you tying with each other, there is also an, uh, a spectator. Someone in my place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the body language through which um, personalities are expressed while uh, while in ropes, while tying, while uh, while in the rope bondage scene. Uh, those are expressed visually. Okay. So if it, if a finger is twitching, if a toe is twitching, if uh, an, a mouth is opening, if a neck is turned away, those are things that don't make sense if they are not visible. Okay. And visible, I don't necessarily mean like I mean visible here because the vision transports like 90% yeah, yeah. of our senses. So also audible and, and, yeah, and so on true. and so forth. But uh, ma make the, like I invite every viewer and you uh, tie your partner mm. uh, towards a wall or towards an open space that is empty. Psychologically a completely different uh, thing. Because there could be somebody. And if there could be somebody, there is somebody. Okay, I see what you mean. So the, there's both the fact that we are uh, spectators and actors of the scene, mm. and the fact that uh, our mind can, if there is a possibility that there is somebody, finally, finally our mind will make so that there is somebody. Yes. I understood well correctly your answer. And I also see myself every time, right? Yeah, uh, you mean uh, uh, you, 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 we have a look on what we are doing while we are doing it? But, mm, sure. Oh, what is it? Uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. Uh, no. Like, uh, I, I don't dare to read it, but the first sentence, yeah. Uh, okay. You want me to read it? <laughs> oh, you can, if you want. No, 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 that's okay. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, it basically says that, uh, like, every time I wake up, I go to the mirror and uh, have to see myself. Mm. This weird formation of uh, flesh. Yeah. My worst meeting of the day every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, that is like maybe back to Yukimura sensei. So um, we make this uh, exercise, kata uh, ashi kaikyaku, the uh, one leg partial suspension while lying on the floor. And uh, I would, like uh, we spent maybe 80 hours tying only that. Oh, yeah. And he would sit on his office chair uh, watching with one eye and say, and I would lift the leg and he would say, no, 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 no. And, uh, I, I what is happening? And then he would come and would raise or like lower the leg for half a centimeter. And he would step away and say, perfect. <laughs> I was like, well, what, what is going on? until I realized he doesn't look at uh, necessarily, or well, not only at the height of the leg, but also when does it have an effect on the person in ropes. Mm. So when you raise the leg into a single leg, uh, like a partial suspension, mm -hmm. you have the first point where the person in ropes feels that somebody is trying to open legs, has mm. an effect. So you can stop there and wait, well, like just pulling, not not even not even lifting. Yeah. 
And then you have the next point where you have like air coming like between your thighs. Mm. And that has an effect. You turn away, you hide your face. So you can stop there as a rigger and wait. Um, and then the next where you have basically visual access to the thi- to the to the one thing that shall not be seen in our society. Mm-hmm. So that has an effect. But when does it have an effect? Not because some douchebag photographer, excuse me, I love many photographers, but <laughs> not because somebody who like uh, read a Wikipedia article about the rule of third says okay. here is the right uh, like height. No, the height is right when the person in ropes uh, is affected by it. Okay. So Yukimura Sensei said the the ropes are there to frame the beauty of the person in ropes. Mm-hmm. But who has the agency to decide what is beautiful other than the person in ropes themselves? Which means I need to make sure that the person in ropes feels beautiful, and beautiful means many things. Mm-hmm. Sure. And at that point becomes beautiful through the emanation of that feeling. Yeah. I agree. The, the aura of the person that feels yeah. beautiful. Um, so so it, it's, it reminds me of your definition of art. The um, conscious deviation of the technical part here is uh, the, the angle of the leg. You don't really care about it. Uh, important point, uh, even if the technical um, book say uh, you have to do uh, 45 yes. degrees or so on, the important point is when the, the lift is good enough to move the, the tired person. Yes. Okay. Mm. The okay. difference between a five-year-old and Jackson Pollock yeah. or, or Matisse for that matter, <laughs> to stay <laughs> consistent with the French people. <laughs> uh, is uh, is that uh, like uh, Matisse, uh, Jackson Pollock, could paint and draw perfectly, mm. but decided to deviate from, from that yeah. consciously or alcohol-induced. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, you have to learn your rope techniques very well in order to consciously, to be able to consciously deviate from the technical perfection. I see what you mean. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not that uh, experienced in uh, Kinbaku or Shibari or erotic rope bondage, but I'm uh, drawing since um, mm. 10, 12 years. So I see what you mean. Yeah, that's, uh, th- that's, uh, like why I emphasize this is uh, like I, I welcome and love everybody who says I want to become better. Mm-hmm. Who I despise are those who go to a weekend intensive and then say, oh, I, I invent my own art. Mm. Yeah. It's maybe after 50 years of studies, you can <laughs> think about not doing your own art, but your own style, at least in, in an art. Um, okay, in your book, you, you have tried to reduce uh, Akinbaku sins to its main constituents, um, yes. humans, the ropes, communication, and power. Uh, can you give us a quick summary of their respective uh, importance uh, in, in the scene, in the rope scene? Oh, without humans is uh, is, is no rope bondage. So, um, uh, it's un- not interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, ropes. So when I when I uh, wrote this book, I thought you can't think about think away ropes uh, because otherwise it wouldn't be rope bondage. I've seen a, a performance by Taco. Uh, yes, doing uh, hot bondage without ropes. Uh, yes, air uh, and it was very impressive. Really, really. Impressive. Yes, uh, I would say nowadays that rope itself is one of the biggest obstacles for rope bondage. Oh yeah, really. Well, uh, it's it's often used in a sense 
almost like uh, Susan Sontag writes about photography. It's used like the camera yeah. for tourists. So uh, like uh, the camera in, in uh, Susan Sontag in the 60s, 70s wrote that tourists use the camera either as a weapon to take over other cultures, mm -hmm. use the violent language of photography the, to take a picture, to shoot, to, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and uh, the other type of tourists use the camera to build a wall between the other culture and themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, I see many people in ropes, in the rope world, who, who seem to hide behind the ropes mm -hmm. in order to not interact, in order to not to have to interact with the person in ropes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I would say rope is a big obstacle for rope bondage in order to interact with the other person. But that is not the question. Uh, no, no, I, that's a very good point. But um, for many people still, uh, rope, uh, I feel like uh, for me, rope is a very good medium to talk to my partner. Yes. And, uh, I was not really at ease to talk about uh, intimate subjects with, um, mm -hmm. with people that I don't know very well. And yes. uh, with ropes, this intimacy is not uh, even a choice. It's, uh, I mean, I have to, to, to be in my intimacy. So I, yeah. I feel like it can be also a major a bridge to, between oh, people. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, has, uh, uh, it, it bears a great chance for people to interact with each other. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a thin, thin line. A narrow path. I understand, for, I understand your argument, but I have not met yet uh, mm. the, this situation where it is an obstacle, uh, except at the very beginning when I was uh, uh, lacking techniques and basic, uh, basic knowledge. Uh, I was a little fighting with the ropes uh, to, yeah. to make them do what I want, but... Uh, Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not my interview, it's yours, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, uh, it's very interesting um, what you have to say. Yeah, so the, the ropes is both a constituent, can become an obstacle. An obstacle. Yes. And um, then there is uh, the two interesting parts, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. That is uh, communication and power. Um, like communication. I read it in my book, why, uh, why communication? Well, you can't not communicate. Yes. When you, are, when you have two people in a room and they turn their backs to each other and don't say a single word, they communicate a lot. Okay. So uh, you can't discuss communication away because um, there is always some form of exchange. When you are connected in, in, in a way and you are connected when you tie with somebody else. Mm. Um, and power. So, uh, like, unf almost unfortunately, many people come from, uh, like, a, um, a very, like, ritualized kink background, BDSM background, where power is understood... Uh, very undoubted, unquestioned. Mm. And uh, I understand power more as, a, as a, a relational term. Again, Foucault, like uh, the power relationship. There's mm. no power top down. Uh, like um, power is, is something that uh, connects people. And um, Like uh, it has since Foucault been interpreted, and I follow this interpretation very, um, very tightly. Actually, like that power is, or like a power relationship, the relationship between two people in the sense of power, is a difference in the access to certain resources. And what are these resources? Um, well, like uh, we know that uh, like power in society is often uh, like connected to political influence, to uh, like uh, access to actual uh, 
monetary or natural resources. Mm -hmm. But in ropes, there is also a power relationship that is a constituent, a constituent um, that is uh, like founded on uh, the access to when I tie with my partner, I and I lead the ropes, I can choose the, how tight the ropes are. Mm -hmm. I can choose the distance between the two of each other. I can choose the pattern I tie. I can choose um, the speed with which I tie, the pace. Mm -hmm. These are, uh, on this stage of the, of the, um, the rope bondage scene, these are resources um, to which one person has more access than the other person. And therefore, there is a power relationship. And this power relationship can be ignored mm -hmm. uh, or can be consciously dealt with. Okay. And uh, I chose the, cho the latter because it bears so much um, possibility, so much potential to read somebody better. It gives uh, a vast reservoir of, um, of, of questions for the interview I lead. Okay. If I, uh, if I choose to um, consciously kind of um, deal with that power relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mean that is, that the is, way uh, you, you will uh, address this power relationship gives you an infinite palette? Palette? I don't know if yes. it's an English word. Yeah, a palette. Of, of right, right, right. Of, a palette of questions and of yes. a, a mood behind those questions. Yes. Yes. To to help you uh, read, uh, detect, like uh, when you dig uh, for something with, <laughs> you know, yes. you try to look where it is in the song. Yes, 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 yes. Like an archaeologist. <laughs> yes, like an archaeologist. Um, well, what does an archaeologist do? An archaeologist also like measures the field. An archaeologist uh, surveys uh, the, the field, then excavate first with like the heavy machines, then finer and finer machines. And um, when you ignore that power relationship, you might only have your like a big machine, mm -hmm. one type of a big machine. And uh, you might find like one big wall down in the, in, this, in, the, in the soil, but you will never find the little coins. Yeah. But you need those little coins to get the better picture, to get the whole picture. Yeah. So uh, what an archaeologist does is very violent, uh, but also very yeah. subtle and, and yeah, very, very small. Subtler and subtler. Uh, the further they go, but, the we go. Uh, yes, often. yes. Um, you, in your book, you compare an, er an erotic rope bondage scene to an interview. Can you mm -hmm. describe us why and what has drawn different types of uh, interviews that are relevant to this comparison? Why is easily answered. It is, um, it is for me the, the best available, that doesn't mean it's the best, but the best available <laughs> um, picture to, comp to connect the, um, let's not say picture, let's say image. Yeah. Um, to, to combine the communication discourse with the power discourse. Okay. In an interview, you always have a certain power relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, and an interview, and that is the most important thing for rope bondage, I would say. An interview is failed if either the interviewer talks all the time and no answer comes from the interviewee, yeah. or if an interviewee takes over the interview and decides the direction. Yeah. Well, politicians are trained explicitly to take over the interview. 
that would be in rope bondage, the, like uh, for the lack of a better this description right now or in a short uh, time frame, uh, the topping from the bottom in a rope scene. Right? Tie me like so. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the interviewer talking all the time would be the like the rigger who just like starts with the single column tie and then ties, 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 and then unties, 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 and then thinks uh, like, uh, oh, now uh, we had such a deep connection. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, like you had two monologues parallel to each other, but you didn't have a dialogue. Yeah. Um, that, that's the point I realized while uh, reading your book. Um, uh, in... in uh, Speaking conversation, I don't like uh, uh, when there is a blank, and uh, I'm the same in uh, in the roads. So I, I have to to try to work on that and to accept. Uh, I'm a very good listener uh, in speaking conversation, and I think as well in the roads. Uh, I'm not sure. If I have to ask the question to my models, but uh, <laughs> the, the the fact is that I don't like uh, the, the the blank. So in the roads, I. I I'm exactly the same. I, I realized that a few days ago while reading, while reading your book. So I have to work on that. There uh, is no such thing as a blank. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know yet. I'm not skilled enough. <laughs> um, uh, um, John Cage, composer. Yeah. Um, that is actually the like in my in my school one of the most important and one most one of the most dangerous exercises. Mm -hmm. um, Four thirty three. The uh, the composition by John Cage is uh, a piece of music for any ensemble of musicians or soloists, um, and it is four minutes thirty three seconds playing a pause. Okay, there is a pause of four minutes forty three seconds. Yeah, you don't you don't hear the musicians like take uh, like uh, get ready to to play, yeah. but they play a pause. And uh, when it was first performed in nineteen fifty two, I think the um, the critics ran out and said like, "What what the hell? <laughs> what the like I don't pay for for five minutes uh, silence." Yeah. And John Cage said, you fools did not understand there is no such thing as silence. In the first movement, you could hear like, um, what did he say, like distance thunder rolling and some raindrops on the windows. Mm. In the second movement, you could hear a baby crying or so. And in the third movement, you could hear the disappointed people <laughs> standing up and walking outside. <laughs> but there is no such thing as silence. And... If you tie, you will see that if you step back, understandably step back, like not just in the middle of a sentence, walk out, mm -hmm. but at the end of an utterance uh, with a proper punctuation mark, body language punctuation mark, yeah, sure. step back and remain in silence you will see that the person in ropes will start talking very soon. And there is no such thing as silence. And those are then the things that become interesting. Because the person in ropes will start talking about things that they are never able to talk about because nobody listens. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean. That's um, something very interesting that I will have to try as soon as I can go out. Uh, well, careful, <laughs> careful with that because many people. Uh, so I, when I say this now, don't edit out the 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 uh, what I say afterwards. But okay. everyone is fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> but we have unfortunately in uh, like a modern so-called Western civilization um, created a society where it is adequate to heal those cracks, to hide them, mm -hmm. to make them go away. 
Whereas in uh, like um, other cultures, in uh, previous past cultures, it has become an art to um, to celebrate cracks. Uh, okay. ki- kitsugi, right? In Japan, the, like uh, w- when the pottery is broken, oh, yeah. you fix it with gold lacquer mm-hmm. so that the cracks are visible because the cracks uh, tell a story. Yeah. And what I do with uh, ropes and with listening to somebody is um, I try to make them know that I'm not there to hide their fucked up deadness, their cracks, okay. but to celebrate it because this is what makes somebody interesting and beautiful. I love that. Mm, me too. That's very interesting. <laughs> uh, okay. The, um, so we, we talked about uh, the different constituents of a scene. Um, you... Uh, no, that's, sorry, that was a good question. Uh, so, the, in the different type of interviews that you described in your book, uh, there is also one for which you are very well known in the world. It's uh, the Rambo style. You told, told us um, about it a few minutes earlier. Um, what are its particularities compared to some other well-known styles? Or, So, because it is a, a, a common misconception when I hear people talk about interview and Rambo and so on. So, interview is not a style. Mm-hmm. It is not a way of applying ropes. It is a, a description or an image of all kinds of styles. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, and Rambo is one of those styles, one of like one way of applying ropes. And uh, when you, uh, if you, if you go and say, uh, you look at the rope scene from the perspective, excuse me, from the perspective of the pace of uh, applying the ropes, and from the perspective of Uh, the variation of intensity of applying the rope Mm. and from the perspective of movement in space, then I would say all rope scenes, all rope styles have a certain variation of pace, variation of uh, uh, like um, uh, intensity, a variation of movement in space. And Ranbo has... Uh, in my understanding, in my understanding, how I define it, let's say, uh, has a very high amplitude. So, um, of of these three things, okay. Plus, it has this like emphasis on um, the element of surprise. I want to read my partner because I want to like um, uh, meet them kind of uh, like um, uh, like off guarded Mm -hmm. so uh, when Mm -hmm. I wait there until the tension is the tension in the head is uh, is so high and then I jump on them and throw them around in the room um, then I get the different answer than if I come there and say like okay let's tie this TK in the same uh, like uh, pace with the same intensity all the time. Mm-hmm. And Ranbo is just like um, from extremely high like pace or speed to extremely low speed in very quick succession, whereas other styles are more like evened out, leveled. Mm-hmm. I would say that's um, that's the difference. The the amplitude of uh, the distance, the, the the intensity and speed. Okay. The element of surprise and uh, movement in space comes anyways. And you use uh, the element of surprise like um, I, I don't know uh, the name in English, but uh, there is a tool to assess the quality of gold. Uh, uh, Pierre de Touche, Touchstone. Uh, yeah. 
but yeah. That's yeah, so element of element of surprise. Uh, if I if you can expect the question that I ask you, then you can prepare your answer. Yeah. Okay. So you you use it to reveal the truth. Yes. Um, those interviews are conducted using a specific nonverbal languages. You already told us a little about that, but can you tell us a little more about the vocabulary and the grammar of the nonverbal uh, language during the scene? Mm. So in my in my book, I uh, provided uh, as like as a very basic scaffolding yeah. for. Uh, um, a vocabulary and a grammar. Mm -hmm. That is uh, basically the interviewer asks the same question in different contexts and different qualities all over. That is, um, do you like this? Mm -hmm. Do you like if I uh, tie around your neck? Do you like if I raise your leg? Do you like if I do this, 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 this? And the mm -hmm. answers are uh, like always, um, like either like yes tie me like so which i'm not interested in because stopping from the bottom mm -hmm. uh or like fuck yes <laughs> i i want to be tied like this and uh, then there are two no's that i was talking about and one is um the inside scene no and one is the outside scene no okay um I, I like to compare it in my classes, in my workshops with, um, with theater. There is this common uh, conception that uh, like, or this, this uh, romantic goal that uh, um, an actor who wants to play a role very well has to become that role. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at Klaus Maria Brandauer playing uh, King Lear, Shakespeare. Okay. He has to become this madman. Yeah. And um and and the play is on a stage and there is an audience. And that stage provides a border between in scene and outside scene. But if in the scene happens uh, like if if something happens in the scene that is not part of the play then uh, like, uh, you have to ask yourself whether to interrupt that uh, scene or not. Mm -hmm. So if uh, King Lear dies at any point other than at the end when he holds his daughter in his arms, mm -hmm. then hopefully a doctor in the audience jumps or first responder jumps on stage and helps him. Mm, sure. But if he, if he dies at the right moment, then hopefully no first responder jumps up and helps him, right? So um, we, I said uh, previously, we, by tying, we enter these totally other spaces, these heterotop het heterotopics. And um, by doing so, we uh, invert commonly agreed upon moral standards. And one thing that is in many like group scenes, um, one of the most important things is this uh, play of like not wanting to to do something like i'm i'm tied up like other yeah. than in a rope scene who wants to be tied up yeah nobody so um na i i'm very hesitant to use the word natural but uh, let's say it for the moment and uh, like uh naturally you react when you're tied up with like no 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 mm. but that has the appeal for many people, including myself, mm. uh, when I'm in ropes as well as when I'm tying. So I would uh, say there is an inside scene no that is uh, that is similar to the to King Lear dying at the right moment, mm. and there is an outside scene no that is no I don't like this and I don't want to do this. And this can be expressed very differently. This can be expressed verbally through a safe word or through uh, like a what the fuck no. Mm -hmm. But it can also be expressed through freezing, through reactions that are different from other reactions. And that is a very like fine, dangerous, but also interesting line that I would recommend students not 
to go except in one very like um, uh, distinct and controlled and negotiated like uh, uh, circumstance. So um, back to the vocabulary and 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 grammar. Uh, so in terms of vocabulary, to summarize, yes. we have uh, one question: Do you like this? Yes. And two type of yes. Uh, yes. And two type of no's. Yes. The yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, uh, which can lead to uh, top bottoming, mm -hmm. and uh, that has to be avoided. Mm -hmm. And the fuck yes, that has to be looked for. Yes. And uh, the inside sin no, knows, uh, yes. which are in character. Yes. Say, yes. Uh, and that are perfectly acceptable to to ignore or, or mm -hmm. the opposite side. Uh, and the outside sin knows that that have to be acknowledged and respected. And uh, yes. Uh, okay. Yes. So that's it for the vocabulary. And regarding well, that is that is the basic. That yes. is the very yes. foundation of how to jam all the different uh, utterances, possible utterances, into something that I can teach. Yeah, sure. Yeah, a question and a way to say yes, a way to say no, it's indeed a very basic vocabulary that it's a uh, yes. point for the vocabulary of, uh, yes. uh, of bondage. If, if I can bring, I refrain from uh, like uh, uh, bringing too many examples, like images in my book, because I didn't want to give the reader like um, prepared, like fast food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted readers to, to uh, think about uh, examples themselves. But uh, can maybe testify, I, yeah. I can testify that from your book takes a lot of time to read because of that. It's not fast food. We are not that used to, <laughs> to uh, cook the book uh, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry and glad at the same time. Uh, that's an amazing book. I love it. Um, uh, one example that I like to bring. Uh, like to extend this basic scaffolding of uh, like, uh, do you like this? And yes, yes, no, no. Mm -hmm. Is uh, for example, the shoulder. I tie a rope, like I bring ropes over the shoulder. Um, everybody is familiar with this, uh, like very patronizing, like shoulder clapping, like when mm -hmm. dad does it or your boss does it or so. Where mm -hmm. does that come from? And why does it feel uncomfortable when you are clapped on your shoulder? Um, I would say it is a very like a direct descendant of the medieval knighting. Oh yeah, Knight, knighting does not mean like like uh, Disney romanticizes it uh, so like a uh, horribly like wrong that uh, you are so cool and therefore you are a knight. No, it means you are mine. Yeah, and I bring a sword next to your your mm -hmm. uh, neck. And if you fuck up, you're done. And uh, the clapping on the shoulder doesn't mean you are so cool and uh, well done. It means you are mine. Don't undermine my authority. So when we tie with each other and I bring a rope over the shoulder and I don't, and I'm not aware of the possibility of that meaning, then I lost an opportunity to express something. And I lost an opportunity to ask something. And I lost an opportunity to get an answer. So uh, like uh, when I tie over the shoulder, I most of the times overexpress it, like almost act, act it or reenact a yeah. nighting scene and wait for the reaction. I bring a rope next to your neck do you trust me? If you fuck up, you're you're done. <laughs> like that is over. Like overacted. Yeah. But still, I get I get an answer. If I do that and I don't hurt the collarbone, please don't bring the knuckles too close to the collarbone when you do this. Mm -hmm. Some people, depending on their daily mood, will go immediately on their knees. And like lower their, their head. And some people will resist and like raise and go up. Well, that's a valid information. That's a, that's a very interesting answer. That gives me a lot of information about how this person could be read now mm -hmm. and how I can proceed. 
Hmm. Will it be more of a fight? Hmm. Or is there submission? So that is an example. And it's not like, do you like this? It's like, do I will you it? want to be mine? <laughs> okay. That sounds okay. That very sense, right? Okay. So th that can be added to this vocabulary. I can express a lot of things that, uh, like not only I, one can express lots of things through body language. It, it can be, uh, it can be close to do you like this? Because if you touch the rope, you say you are mine now. Do you like yes. it? And it says once again, do you like it? Yes. Um, we start by do you like this? And I will see for those other questions later, personally. <laughs> That's my point of view. Um, regarding the grammar, we have talked about mm -hmm. vocabulary. But uh, regarding the grammar, what, what is the main grammar of the scene? So a grammar is. Um, It depends a little bit on the on the on the structure of the interview. Whether I lead a police uh, like interrogation or I lead a psychotherapy like a psychoanalysis session, where I ask one question and let the person talk mm -hmm. and interrupt only when it's necessary. But um, I would say grammar is uh, like um, a structure of how the vocabulary can be like uh, assembled. And that means that um, that includes in my in my philosophy, in my linguistic approach to rope bondage, uh, erotic rope bondage, if you want. Um, no, no, it's your book. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm happy for all the like, input. Mm, <laughs> that includes a certain structure of how um, of how. Uh, in a punctuation marks are set, for example. Mm. Like, do you like this can be uttered as an, as, as an, as an order. Mm. You, you mm. like this. You mm. will like this. Uh, and I can get my no, no, uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, can, uh, I can ask, uh, do you like this as a, as a almost submissive like, question with a question mark. Do you, do you like it if I do this? Uh, head, head down. Um, it can be uttered as a normal like, utterance, as a sentence with a period afterwards. It can be, um, like I would say, that uh, the question of interruption is a question of grammar. So when you if ask the question, become the grammar? the way you ask it and the, yes. the when you ask it. Yes. I would say that the position and the distance becomes a question of the grammar. Of course it's a it's a vocabulary like it's a it's a word in some way. Um whether I am arm length away or whether I'm uh, like um like nose length away. But still, like the cont when is it appropriate and adequate to do something is a question of uh, like a, is is a question of grammar. You can't just assemble your words however you want. Mm. You you have to give them structure. Otherwise, the Ferdinand de Saussure, the the language contract doesn't work mm. if there is no grammar. The story and the communication will not be there. So yes, the, yes, the interview will be over and very soon. Yes, it won't be understandable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then and, and then uh, like uh, with grammar, of course, like um, one of the biggest influences on uh, uh, to to me to my philosophy is uh, Jacques Derrida. Yeah. And uh, his book, uh, Grammatology. Mm -hmm. And um, like how he switches, uh, like, uh, like um, critiques linguistics for its focus on spoken language only and uh, tries to like uh, put uh, and, like eyes on written language. 
mm. and how he develops his idea of um, uh, like these loops in time, history, reality that uh, uh, the past or the present not only is the presence a function of the past, mm -hmm. but the past becomes a, a function of yeah. the presence. Yeah, uh, right. that's where I am right now in your book. <laughs> in the, it, oh. it pushed me in uh, at least an hour to understand the sentence, then one, two hours to, to think about it. So that's exactly where I am right now in your book. Um, it's a very interesting concept. Um, we, we have talked about uh, the humans, the ropes, the communication, and now you guess my My, my next question is um, you emphasize a lot the power relationship between the tying person and the tied one in your book. Uh, can you tell us more about this relationship? Well, I said already the, the, the difference in the access to resources constitutes uh, this, uh, this power relationship. And uh, it is It is a staged power relationship yeah. because, uh, like morally, all all modern ethical systems uh, rely on equity of human beings. Mm -hmm. I would say most, at least, I'm not aware of one. But let's not exclude everything here. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this power relationship is not um, uh, is is a staged power relationship. That means that two individuals uh, sign basically a contract, metaphorically, or mm -hmm. like some people even uh, sign it on paper. Yes, yeah, some people sign a, a contract uh, to to uh, uh, like enter a space in which there is an explicit difference in access to resources, mm -hmm. and they enter that space together. So, um, with the opportunity, hopefully, for both to always exit it unilaterally. Yeah. yeah. That's very important to respect yes. once again the stage yes. effect of this. Yes. But other than this, this power relationship is nothing else but uh, like, uh, why, why are we so into this power relationship? Because it's a transgression into a taboo. Yeah. It is something that counteracts society. It is a rebellion, right? Who are we? Why are we who we are? Because society tries to make us such and such, mm -hmm. and we refuse that if the pressure becomes too strong. Well, like uh, uh, people in my childhood, in my uh, teenage years, tried to make me a Catholic. They tried to make me a um, uh, like valuable member of society, <laughs> and they tried to like some tried to make me a Nazi, and all of them tried to make tried so hard to do that that I refused all of them. Yeah. So uh, we we like I would say, if there is something that uh, is. Uh, like uh, I don't want to start like Chomsky, but like, no, no means. But like, uh, if there is something inherent to human nature, uh, then I would say this uh, um, curiosity as a form of rejection of adaptation. Okay, that's, that's why we tie with each other because it's not common. Yeah. It's something that counteracts everything that society tells us what is good. It is, with Foucault, a totally other space in which the, the, the power relationship that shall be leveled in everyday society can be different. Mm. I would say that this is a uh, very, like, very, at the very core of why we are doing these things. Yeah, and that's, um, it, 
while you were speaking, I was thinking that maybe why there is so many curious pe people in Shibari. Um, yeah. Uh, most of us are very curious of things. That's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. I agree with you. Um, so as I told you, I've read um, a big part of your book, but I've not finished. Um, it, it, it's very complex subject for me to, to integrate in my roles. I, I'm uh, doing Shibari since about two years. Um, so what are the first steps that you can advise me to integrate those uh, thoughts, those insights, or this wisdom and into my roles tomorrow, let's say tomorrow, but not tomorrow, but in the, in the near future? Or what are the first steps that you advise me? What are the quick wins that I can find? Uh, I thought about that question yeah. and I have uh, multiple answers <laughs> um, and I, I have this problem sometimes now that I teach for almost 10 years now, ropes, okay. that, um, and deal with ropes every day, mm -hmm. uh, that I don't know what is easy and what is not easy. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, professor at university, like I sat with him in his office and he said, oh, like, yeah, this, this differential, like uh, you have to do this and this and this. And he explained for 15 minutes and I was sitting there I was like, I, yeah, I know I can do this in my head right now. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh, and this functional, like you can solve this in your head. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> yeah. so, no <laughs> no was, feeling for what is I difficult and what is... Uh, but I would say one, one advice is to, to try to um, allow for mediocre rope scenes. Okay. Not like if you try to set up every rope scene such that, this, such that it is better than all previous rope scenes, you will fail sooner rather than later. Okay. If um, you allow for mediocrity, if you allow for a beige scene, yeah. that is okay. You will be able to widen your, uh, your ability to deal with frustration. I mean, the ability to deal with frustration, to have not succeed in doing a better scene than the previous one? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, if you go and, if, if I go and say to every performance, to every scene that I, that I do, oh, I have to do this fantastic, I don't know, suspension transition. I have to do... I have to go under this, like, so deep under the skin of my partner. I have to read them properly. I will set myself up for failure. And uh, by saying, let's tie and see what comes out, it's easier to, like, it's, it's easier to not get frustrated. And I would say that many people I observed tying for a, a couple of years or like one, two, three years, there is a lot of potential for frustration as it was in myself. Why can't this, why did this rope scene fail? Why can't I be better already? Hmm. Because it takes time. And it is okay to, to, uh, to have a, a beige scene. Eddie coined this, I think she did, uh, coined this uh, this um, like uh, this phrase like uh, people in 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 BDSM say like a uh, like green and and uh, and red right calling red mm -hmm. is like stop yeah. and uh, she coined the term like calling beige yeah well it wasn't bad but it was also not great let's do some Netflix or so <laughs> yeah. instead. And nobody is like angry at each other. It's just like you miss each other. You can't have every time a fantastic 
inspirational, deep conversation with somebody. Yeah. But if you go into every conversa conversation with the goal of having a fantastic, deep, inspiring conversation, you will fail. I see. That is uh, maybe one thing that uh, I would advise very early on. And the other thing is that this may be a little bit, maybe a little bit difficult, is find the proper moments for punctuation marks in your body language. Okay, do you have an example of punctuation marks in body language? So, uh, like an interview, in an interview, a person, like an interviewer asks a question. If the question stops in the middle of the sentence, the interviewee won't know what to answer. Like, what, what, what do you mean? Hmm. If you tie and you tie a single column tie and you stop in the middle of the knot because you read my book and say, oh, make pauses, mm -hmm. the person in ropes will say, what? <laughs> Okay. But if you finish the knot and you close the knot and like tying a knot has multiple meanings and has a social background. People, people associate something with a finished knot mm -hmm. and you tie it down and then you pause, you will get a completely different response because the person in ropes knows that it is now Uh, like that there is now room for answering. Mm. Um, that would be one example. If you tie somebody and you step out, like you step away a meter, right? Mm. And you just like finish a knot and do something else and you like in the middle of an utterance step out, the person in ropes will say, what, what is going on, on now? Like, why, why are you stopping out? They will probably open their eyes and look, where are you? But if you step out after having made a proper notion of stepping out, a proper mm -hmm. punctuation mark at the end of your sentence, of your nonverbal sentence, of your rope sentence, then the person will know that you will step out or will feel it and uh, knows that it is now their time to answer, to talk. Mm -hmm. So find the proper moments to do certain things. Okay. That is very hard. So make the pose at the good time. <laughs> the... Y yes. Okay. When is it good to when is it good, write the book, write the poem? When is it good to finish the poem? When is it good to finish a book? If you read Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment, um, and uh, the moment when uh, Raskolnikov's uh, like, um, conscience becomes so like, burdening and uh, so oppressive that he admits killing the, the pawnbroker, uh, then is a good moment to finish the book soon. Mm. I find Dostoevsky did the disservice by writing about uh, like uh, his sister and his mother taking the train home. Uh, I have not read many of the of his books. Uh, I don't know if it's. I've seen the same. You finish the. You you have to find a proper moment to finish the 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 poem. Yeah, the story. Yes. Uh, I have a last question for you. Um, <laughs> the last one is about uh, the actuality. Um, do you have a last advice for uh, Kimbaku enthusiasts that are locked in their home uh, currently? Mm, tie, 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 tie. <laughs> And if you don't have somebody to tie with, uh, tie your leg, tie your arm, tie your, do I have a rope? Tie your hands with one hand, tie mm -hmm. the other hand. Uh, read, read books that you enjoy and think about could this have an, an adequate parallel, a similarity, an image that is uh, like applicable for ropes. Mm. 
widen your horizon. Yes. I would say mm, that's one of our goals with uh, those videos. So that's perfectly adequate. <laughs> don't don't look only don't watch only rope videos. <laughs> First, yeah. there's a whole bunch of crap out there. Yeah. Second, yeah. when you tie to a video, nobody is there to like uh, to tell you something about the tension, uh, about the placement. Like uh, when you find a video that says, uh, "Oh, like this is the proper placement," then turn it off and do something else. The proper placement is nowhere written down other than in the facial expressions of the person you tie with. Yeah, I see what you mean. And the proper tension. So look into your partner's face when you tie them. And by face, I mean body language. Yeah. Thanks a lot for all those answers. Uh, I took a lot of your time. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was very insightful. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's time to say goodbye to our spectators. Um, au revoir à tous. Si vous avez aimé cette vidéo, n'hésitez pas à la liker et à vous abonner à la chaîne. Uh, merci beaucoup, Georges. Uh, merci beaucoup à toi. <laughs> au revoir à tous et à bientôt. <laughs>